Hey, what's up, guys? Here with another video. Um, watching Joe Rogan talk to Daryl Davis, how Daryl Davis came to convince KKK members to leave. So let's go check this out. <laughs> the Joe Rogan experience. I read your story. Uh, I saw a thing about you on NPR, and uh, it's crazy. So. The Joe Rogan experience. I read your story. Uh, I saw a thing about you on NPR, and uh, it's crazy. You've converted how many people? 200 KKK members? You've got them to drop their robes? Right, some directly, some indirectly, yes. How did that all happen? Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, <clears throat> I keep running into these guys. I'm a, I'm a musician by trade. Right. Blues so, musician, uh, right? Rock and roll, blues. Swing, jazz, my degrees in jazz, but hey, I'll, I'll play whatever you want me to play. <laughs> <laughs> You're paying, I'm playing. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, everybody likes music, you know, even the KKK. <laughs> so, you. I like how you use that. Everyone loves music, even the KKK. <laughs> to, to, uh, to my advantage, um, I was playing in a bar one night in uh, Frederick, Maryland, an all white bar. And when I say all white, I don't mean that blacks couldn't go in. What I mean is that uh, blacks chose not to go in. They weren't welcome. And uh, here I was in this bar with this country band, a friend of mine's band. I was the only black guy in the band, <clears throat> only black guy in the bar. And upon finishing the first set, this um, I'm walking to the, to the band table, and somebody came up and put their arm around my shoulder. I turned around to see who it was. It was a white gentleman, maybe 15, 18 years older than me. And uh, he says, yeah, yeah, I really enjoy your all's music. I said, thank you. It's just his hand. And he pointed at the stage and said, you know, I've seen this here band before, but I ain't never seen you before. Where'd you come from? And I explained, yeah, you know, they told me they played here before, but this is my first time in this place. I just joined the band. And he said, well, man, I really like your piano playing. This is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. <laughs> and <laughs> I, wasn't, um, I wasn't offended, but I was rather surprised because as I said, you know, this guy's like maybe 15 years older than me. And he didn't, he did not know the uh, black origin of Jerry Lee Lewis's style of piano playing. Um, I, I explained it to him. I got it from the same place Jerry Lee did, from black blues and boogie-woogie piano players. Where the guy was incredulous. Oh, no, 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 Jerry Lee invented that. I ain't never heard no black man play like that except for you. So I'm thinking, okay, well, this, this guy never heard of Little Richard or, or uh, Fats Domino. And uh, <clears throat> I said, look, man. I know Jerry Lee Lewis. He's a friend of mine. He's told me himself we learned how to play. The guy did not buy that I knew Jerry Lee. He didn't buy that Jerry Lee learned anything from black people. But he was so fascinated that he wanted to buy me a drink. I was, I was like a novelty to him. <laughs> oh, shit, that's crazy. That's nuts, man. So I went back to his table. I had a cranberry juice. And then he announces, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. And now I'm, I'm the one who's incredulous. Like, how can that be? You know, I've sat down with thousands of white people, anybody else, had a meal, a beverage, a conversation. How was it this guy had never done that? And innocently, I asked him, I said, why? And he didn't answer me at first. He stared down at the tabletop. And I asked him again, and his buddy sitting next to him elbowed him in the side and said, tell him, tell him, tell him. I said, tell me. You know, I'm trying to figure out what is this mystery? He looks at me just as plain as day, and he says, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I burst out laughing. <laughs> uh, you know, because it was... <laughs> you say this, I'm a member of the Ku Klux Klan. It's you know, just like the way you said, like... <laughs> I think I would have busted out laughing, too. I don't know. I wouldn't know. I mean, I wouldn't get offended by it, because it is what it is, but, you know... I would try to understand people like that rather than, like, you know. Like, I wouldn't get offended. The first thing I would try to do is try to understand them and see if we can come to a level playing field, you know. It was getting weirder by the second half. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I knew a lot about the Klan. Uh, I, I'd been studying racism since I was a 10-year-old kid because of an incident that happened to me back then. And I bought books on black supremacy, white supremacy, the KKK, the Nazis, the neo-Nazis. Um, to try to understand this mentality. 
And I knew a Klansman would not come up and just throw his arm around some black guy's shoulder and praise his talent and want to you know, hang out with him and buy him a drink. So uh, you know, this guy's jerking me around. So I'm laughing, and he goes inside his pocket and pulls out his wallet and produces his Klan membership card. They have cards? Oh, yeah, yeah. And he gave me his uh, card. I looked at it, and I recognized the uh, Klan insignia, which is a, a red circle with a white cross and a red blood drop in the center of the cross. And I realized, oh, man, this thing's for real. So I stopped laughing. It wasn't funny anymore. And I gave it back to him. And we chatted about the Klan and different things. But the dude gave me his phone number and wanted me to call him whenever I was to return to this bar so he could bring his friends, meaning Klansmen and Klanswomen, to see this black guy play like Jerry Lee. I'm not sure he called me a black guy to his friends, but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I said, I'll call you. Wow. So um, I would call him every six weeks on a Wednesday or Thursday and say, hey, man, you know, we're down at the uh, Silver Dollar, you know, Friday and Saturday. Come on out. He'd come out both nights. And he'd bring Klansmen and Klanswomen, and they'd come and gather around the bandstand and watch me play the piano or get out there and dance to our music. Now, you know, they, they didn't come in robes and hoods, right? They came in street clothes. And um, on the break, I would go to his table say hello. Some of them were very curious. They'd hang out there and want to meet me and talk to me. Others would see me coming and get up and take off and go stand some other part of the room where it's like, I just want to see you. I don't want to deal with you kind of thing. Mm. So that was fine. And um, <clears throat> I decided later on I would write a book because I'd been looking for an answer to a question that I had formed when I was age 10. My question was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And this was a result of having marched in a Cub Scout parade at the age of 10, being the only black scout in this uh, parade. And while most people on the streets and sidewalks were cheering us, uh, we were marching from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, to uh, commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. And people were like waving flags and yelling and screaming, the British are coming and all of the <laughs> time, except for one small pocket of people who were throwing rocks and bottles at me. And at age 10, um, my first thought was, oh, those people over there don't like the scouts. Uh, that's how naive I was. It wasn't until my den mother, my cub master, my troop leader all came rushing over and huddled over me with their bodies, these white people, and escorted me out of the danger that I realized I was the only target because nobody else was getting this protection. And these were adults or these were other children? These were a couple, uh, it was maybe about five people. I remember there being a couple of kids, maybe my age, a year older, uh, and some adults. Adults who, were throwing rocks yes. and bottles at a 10-year-old boy. That's correct. Yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, I, <clears throat> I kept saying to, to the, my, uh, my scout leaders, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything because now I'm trying to find out what did I do? Right. You know, wh why are they doing this to me? Right. And they kept, you know, shushing me, telling me to hurry up, move along, it'll be okay. So they never answered the question as to why this was happening. When I got home that day, after this parade, my mother and father, who were not there, were putting mercurochrome and band-aids on me and asking me, how did I fall down and get all scraped up? I told them I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what had happened. And for the first time in my life, my mom and dad sat me down and explained to me what racism was. At the age of 10, I had never heard the term racism. Now, what, what year was this? 1968. Okay. Um, I'll tell you why. Because my dad was a U.S. Foreign Service. So we spent a lot of time overseas. Every two years, you go to a country, you're there for two years, come back home for a few months, and then you get reassigned to another country. So <clears throat> when I was overseas, uh, in elementary school, my classes were filled with kids from all over the world. Anybody who had an embassy in those countries, all us embassy kids went to the same school. My class was full of kids from Nigeria, Italy, France, Germany, Japan, Russia, you name it. Um, if you were to open the door to my classroom and stick your head in, you would say, this looks like a United Nations of little kids, because that's exactly what it was. And we all got along. Then I would come home after that two-year assignment, 
and I would be in either all black schools or all white schools. I'm sorry, all black schools or all black and white schools, meaning the uh, still segregated or the newly integrated schools. And there was not the amount of diversity in my classroom that I had overseas. Today, you walk into a classroom, you know, you can't tell where people are from, from all over. So literally, um, between 1961 and like 1968, 1970, I was living about 12 years into the future when I was living overseas mm. because that, that multicultural scene had yet to come to this country. And um, when it did, of course, I was already prepared. Unfortunately, many of my peers were not. So I didn't experience racism. Had I lived here my, you know, my whole life, I might have had a different perspective and not taken this path. Um, so I was very curious about it and fascinated with it. Like, how can somebody hate you when they don't even know you? It was just beyond my comprehension. And I knew something was wrong because the people who did this to me did not look any different than my little French friends, my Swedish friends, or my fellow Americans from the embassy, or for that matter, my fellow Americans right there, you know, at the school where I went, where we did the march. So I knew it wasn't a color thing. In fact, when my parents told me this, I did not believe my parents. I thought for some reason, my parents are lying to me because my 10 year old brain could not process the idea that someone who had never seen me, had never spoken to me, knew nothing about me, would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than the color of my skin. So I did not believe them. Well, a month and a half later, that same year, 1968, on April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I remember it very well. Uh, we were in Massachusetts, same place, and uh, nearby Boston, Washington, D.C. When he talks about being a 10-year-old and not comprehending why someone would hate him and not know, the, know him, I kind of had the same feeling. But of course, I didn't grow up in a time where people were throwing, white people were throwing rocks at me. I grew up with white friends going over to white people's homes and, you know, it's just being normal. I never felt like they wanted to be racist against me. It's actually insane because I didn't start feeling racism until I actually became an adult in society. It wasn't until I became an adult in society where I actually felt like there was some racism going on. Uh, but when I was young, growing up, I never felt racism at all, not even a bit. <laughs> I can't really recall. I think, yeah, there was one instance where a white kid had called me the N-word, and I started flipping tables on him, started trying to fight him. But I never, like, after that, all the other white kids came up to me and said, oh, that guy's an asshole. He's fucked up. He's fucked up. And I had an ex-girlfriend that called me an N-word. But that didn't happen until I was out of high school and it was an adult. And... Um, you know, but I had dated white girls before her, and they never would call me the N-word if I broke it up with them or if they broke up with me. It would just be like a mutually cool thing. Like, it would just be cool. Um, so definitely racism could come in different ways. I see what he's talking about, like how, um, you know, you can have your Scandinavian friends that look like the white Americans in the United States. Um, and your Scandinavian friends aren't going to be like your white American friends. Like the values are a little different. You know, they they would never come up to you and say the N word to you. And frankly, I don't even think it's I don't even I don't even think like in other European countries, slavery is that taught. It's not taught a lot. Uh, and that's just because it's not, you know, part of their history, really. They may touch on it in world history classes but other than that it's not like a huge deal uh, but the united states you know it's like a whole big section of it they even have african-american studies in the united states which <laughs> whatever but yeah it's 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 a big convoluted thing and um like i said when, when i was growing up i never really experience white supremacy or never experience like I've never even met a Klansman of course I know they're out there but I I've never met one and every time I've every time I've had white friends it, it's never really been an issue um, 
but usually I don't try to be friends with white people. Usually I just end up in friendships somehow through a job or a career field. Or I've met a lot of my friends that are white through YouTube and through other means, Instagram. It's just not a big deal. I don't see it as one. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you guys later. Um, and, yeah, let's keep on going. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, it's not over. <laughs> it's not over. My hometown, Chicago, Illinois, uh, Philadelphia, Detroit, Baltimore, Richmond, L.A., all burned to the ground with violence and destruction, all in the name of this new word that I had learned called racism. And so then I realized, my parents had told me the truth, this, this phenomenon called racism does exist, but why? I don't understand why. Okay, so it's here, but why? And so that's when I formed that question. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? And so I've been looking for the answer to that question now for 51 years. I'm uh, 61 years old. So um, after I... Uh, I, I um, met this Klansman, oh, maybe, I don't know, three or four months later, I quit that band and went back to playing rock and roll and blues and R&B. And then it dawned on me, Daryl, you know, the answer that you've been seeking since age 10 fell right into your lap. Um, who better to ask that question of, how can you hate me when you don't even know me, than to ask it, of somebody who would go so far as to join an organization whose whole premise has been hating people who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. And this organization has been around for over 100 years. Somebody who would go that far to join the KKK should damn sure have an answer to your question. Mm. So get back in contact with that guy. And why don't you write a book? Because I had every book, I still do, every book written on the Klan. And they all were written by white authors, obviously, because a white author would have, you know, less fear of ramifications talking to a Klansman or interviewing them, um, who would have easier access or could join the Klan undercover, get the story, get out and write about it. So my book became the first book ever written by a black author on the Ku Klux Klan from the perspective of sitting down face to face. I decided I would go around the country interview Clan leaders there in Maryland, where I live, up north, down south, Midwest, and west. And I, I said I would start right there in Maryland. So <clears throat> I got a hold of that guy, and I wanted him to introduce me to the clan leader from Maryland. What was his reaction? When, um, when I... Who <laughs> declared, like, he, this guy is brave, because he really wanted to know. And I kind of understand that. Like, I kind of want to know what, what's the point of racism as well. Like, is it to inflict pain on what you think is smaller? Or you want to treat these certain types of people like ants because you feel like you just can? It, I wonder what's the point. Is it like that thirst to destroy? Like, it, it, it's a very convoluted question. You know? Do you mind grabbing the microphone and just pull it, just pull sure. it a little closer to you? There you go. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. What was his reaction when you called him up and said, hey, I want to know what makes you guys tick? Like, why are you doing this? Well, actually, <laughs> it's a little funnier than that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, um, I found the guy's number, you know, from the bar, from the Silver Dollar Lounge, and um, I called it. This is like months later, and it had been, it had been disconnected, so I had to track him down. Turned out he had moved. He didn't have a phone, but I was able to get an address. And so I had no way of no, you know, letting him know I'm going to come over and talk to you. So I showed up at his apartment one evening and knocked on the door. And um, I hadn't seen the guy in a while, right? He opens the door and sees me. He goes, Daryl, you know, what are you doing here? And he, and he steps out into the hallway and looks up and down the hallway to see if I brought anybody with me. And, and when he stepped out of his apartment, I stepped in. So he turned around, he comes back in. He goes, what's going on? Are you still playing? What's going on? I said, yeah, 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 I'm playing. But um, I need to talk to you about the Klan. He says, the Klan? I said, yeah, you're a member, right? He goes, well, I was, but I quit. And he went into this long dissertation as to why he quit the Klan. So <clears throat> long story short, I said, I want to meet the Klan leader. Did he quit the Klan because of his interaction with you? No, not no. <laughs> Actually, he, he lied to me. Um, yes, he was no longer in the Klan, but 
uh, what happened was he said he he quit because he didn't he didn't like um, their their uh, ideology. I later found out um, in my research that, and I got this from the guy who banished him, the the leader of the of that particular clan group. Banished. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's, that's their term. They banish you. <laughs> okay. Huh. That's crazy. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I want to really know the answer, um, but maybe we can find it. Thank you so much for watching, and peace.